Hello everyone and welcome to the Vancouver Resource Investment Conference YouTube channel. Today's guest is the founder and managing director of Soar Financial and the CEO of Orin Inc., Mr. Kai Hoffman. Great to have you on the show. Hey Jesse, good to see you. Good to see you too. I want to get started with your broader view of the commodities market. Which commodities right now do you see as winners over the course of the next three to five years? And are you of the belief that we are entering or perhaps already in a commodities bull cycle? Well, that, it's a big question, Jesse, because three to five years is a very long time frame. And uh, if it were to quote Christine Lagarde, you say any forecasting is kind of pointless right now. Um, it, it really depends on where you stand on, on macro trends, what, what you believe is happening in the world right now. Do you believe in deglobalization? Do you believe we're going to hit a fl inflationary or deflationary environment? And I think that has a lot to do with that. Um, overall, if I look at some of the EV trends, of course, electrification, buzzword here, uh, electric vehicles. You, you can't pass up copper. Um, but if we do hit a deflationary environment, uh, then of course, all the metals, base metals and precious metals will be hit hard. So it, like I hate being that analyst as well, it could go up, it could go down, but it really depends on the thesis that you subscribe to. And if you read the, the, the news every morning, you, you probably believe in either side or the other. And uh, me being sort of in the middle here, um, I, I think we're set up to do well. Uh, at least for the next six months, based on what the Fed is doing and what I'm seeing in the markets, inflation, um, but also mortgage rates going up and things like that. People want to protect their money. I'm, I'm quite bullish, let's say precious metals. Um, I, I don't have a price target for you or anything. And I'm also, but I'm also bullish somewhat, as I said, the, the, the future metals, let's call them that, like um, the nickels, the zinc, uh, copper, I think are the three main ones. Lithium, I see, it's going in a bit of a hype phase right now. I see a lot of companies coming up with pegmatite projects, uh, which is great. That means there's there's interest. And I'm personally interested as well. Uh, maybe a bit of an anecdote. I had a, a, a chat with the consul general in Vancouver the other day uh, of Germany. Sorry. And uh, he's like, oh, Kai, like, we, we, we're looking at resource projects. And how can we help? How can we assist? And now there's been of a top down approach to, to the whole uh, future metal side which is really interesting. I'm a burnt child of the 2016s and 2017s uh, from the graphite and lithium time back then. So I'm, I was really cautious, but the, the, the nickel, oh, the nickel, the penny finally dropped uh, on, on my end. So um, the, the governments are getting involved and that really produces positive demand, in my opinion. It's not just the promoters saying, well, we're running into a supply gap. Right, now you've got quite a unique perspective being in Europe, um, in, in Germany. What are you seeing in terms of signs of the energy crisis? Because it's interesting to, to hear from somebody who lives there, because you see all these headlines, all these stories, Germany's deindustrializing, you know, they're, they're burning more coal than ever. People are going to be cold in the winter. The energy prices are skyrocketing. As somebody who's there and has, you know, this observant mind as, as a commodities investor, how, how are you seeing things? Is it over-exaggerated or, or is there trouble up ahead? Well, yeah, yes and no. So if you look at natural gas, um, I think we'll be fine. Uh, we've just signed a long-term LNG agreement with Qatar that kicks in in 2026. Uh, that that should you know cover a part of it. We're not getting any more gas from Russia, but Norway and the Netherlands have sort of picked up the slack for us there. Uh, prices are very high because uh, gas prices sort of set the standard. It's usually the strongest one that sets the price for everything. That's why our power costs are uh, hydro is insane. My power bill is going up quite significantly next year as well. I used to pay 25.6 cents a kilowatt hour. It's going to be 45 cents a kilowatt hour next year. Uh, I know my parents, for example, personal anecdote, have a different power or energy provider. They were going to pay 57 cents uh, and things like that. And I hear from families all, all around me, um, they're they're heating less. They're maybe not heating all the rooms in the house because the, the energy bills and power bills are just going through the roof. Uh, so People are starting to feel it. I think there's going to be a lag when it comes to the, let's say, economy, uh, meaning I just saw that German GDP is actually growing, which I'm actually quite surprised. And uh, I just read that the Black uh, you know, Black Friday week has been uh, a success, at least online. And uh, that is a bit puzzling as well if we are really in a, in a tough uh, economic environment. I want to touch on Orin Inc. and the work you do there because it's very fascinating. I think there's some unique insights you could provide us with. Um, so Orin Inc. is a data mining company tracking the financing activity of mining companies on the TSX, TSXV, and CSE. So could you share any insights from the tracking you've been doing? And are there any key takeaways on the mining space from the data you've seen that you can share with us? 
Yeah, Jesse, pleasure. Absolutely. And uh, as you described it, we're, we're tracking the companies up to $1.5 billion in market cap, uh, just to keep it like to, on a junior level, right? And maybe key takeaway is the financing window is open right now. We've seen financings increase or the dollar amount being raised and uh, demanded by the companies increase over the last four weeks, uh, which is interesting to see. It's sort of in tandem with the gold price. Gold is up now at 1750 this morning, 1760 or so uh, as we're recording this. And uh, financing sentiment just goes hand in hand with the gold price. And uh, that's what we're seeing. We're seeing financings being uh, upsized as well. We see a lot more financings. Only last week, we've seen 44. I think that's the highest number of financings announced that I've seen in a long time. Uh, it used to be like in the mid-20s and low 20s and even high teens uh, for, for the longest time. So that is probably the key takeaway that as of right now, there is a window open. Yes, we're coming into the flow through season as well, where people have to allocate some of that tax money. But uh, I don't think that's the overall. That, that's that's all of it. It's just all flow through. It's there's also hard dollars being raised. So when you approach the mining space in terms of how you deal with your portfolio, are you looking more towards explorers, developers, producers? Is it a combination of all three? And is there any one of those right now as we sit here today that you see as being more undervalued um, than the others? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I, I played the whole space. I, I, I don't mind the 5 million market cap junior explorers that are just pre-drill program. I don't mind. Of course, it's not 90% of my portfolio. Don't get me wrong. Um, but I also like looking at the barracks and the Newmonts, especially at these valuations, because A, they pay you a dividend, and B, they have some nice upside on the gold price, right? Uh, it's, a, it's a double whammy, so to say, uh, gold plus some optionality there, because they're still producing at around $1,100. Of course, they were impacted by inflation as well, uh, rate increase or wage increases as well that they couldn't you know sort of prevent. But uh, th their reserve calculations are also still at 1200 So there's a lot of value and upside still on the balance sheets. And they're almost debt free. Um, other plays, like a bigger part of my portfolio is actually developers. Um, they've been hit quite hard because of the inflationary environment. Nobody believed their production numbers or not production, um, CapEx numbers. Everybody was worried about CapEx blowouts. Uh, and true to a degree, but I don't think it was all just inflation. I think there were a lot of mismanagement going on at some of the companies. But uh, some of the companies, like I'm looking at an Orzone, for example, they started producing and they're still then they're now trading lower than at the time they were still in construction explain that one to me okay um that's that's where i'm seeking value i'm a happy shareholder there for example uh and there are other examples like that as well uh companies that are going into that development phase right now with more robust feasibility studies that just makes sense and you can see sort of inflation waning a little bit i've been hearing commentary from the ceos that inflation starting to sort of i wouldn't say slow down but it, uh, it's more uh, stable. It used to be super volatile. Like one CEO once mentioned to me, he's like, Kai, like I'm getting quotes that are valid for 24 hours. I can't write a study like that. Right. And that, that has changed. And I think that's why there's quite a bit of value to be had in the developer space. So I'd like to get your thoughts on gold from a macro perspective, because we're seeing central banks buying gold at unprecedented rates. We've also seen kind of a collapse in the crypto market, which some people actually believed was was competition. Um, and there's a lot of other tailwinds. Obviously, we're seeing broken monetary policy continue to be implemented. And gold is doing its job for a lot of countries outside of the USA in terms of protecting purchasing power. Um, so where do you see gold moving forward? Obviously, price predictions are kind of meaningless, as you mentioned at, at the top of the show. But do you see gold really breaking out or do you see it kind of doing what it's meant to do and kind of moving along like a workhorse and continuing to allow people to store wealth outside the system, protect purchasing power, as opposed to making people rich? No, good, good question. And uh, I think all is linked to the US dollar, unfortunately, right? Yes, I, I live in Europe, but I don't look at the gold price in euro terms, really. Right. Uh, I, I keep referencing the U.S. dollar and the U.S. dollar is uh, weakening a little bit right now. We're just uh, seeing maybe a dip uh, in, in, the, in the curve right now. And that that sort of pushed gold higher. But we're still in that trend range from 1680 to about 1770. We haven't broken out. We've been moving sideways for the last six to eight months. I'm not a technical analyst. So I'm not going to get too detailed here. But we need either the U.S. dollar to break down further for the U.S. dollar for gold to break out, or we need some macro event pushing it higher. But that's usually only more short term. Uh, when we see those geopolitical events, for example, push gold higher, um, it, it is the U.S. dollar. Let's see what the Fed does. We have two more weeks until the next uh, Fed rate hike is announced. Uh, it's all in the commentary. Powell is speaking, I think, tomorrow as we're recording this. Um, so that could be some signaling as well. <sighs> 
No, it's. Uh, I think we're going to be range bound for a little while unless we really see a big change in the U.S. dollar. So my final question here, because you are going to be at the Vancouver Resource Investment Conference, is going to be January 29th and 30th at the Vancouver Convention Center. There is a link in the description for tickets, which are actually free. So uh, reserve your spot now. Um, but what can people expect from, from your presentation at, at the Vancouver Resource Investment Conference? Yeah, Jesse, I always present on ore and ink in our data that we're looking at from the junior mining perspective, try to give some context, what is happening, what kind of trends are we seeing, where is the money flowing? It's quite interesting to track also flow through financing uh, with the, I, was, I wasn't going to say downfall, but uh, with the political uncertainty more in South America, we've seen a lot more flow through money being raised because it all flows into Canada, tier one jurisdiction. Those are some of the findings we will we'll be looking at or re-examining. We made some calls at the last conference. We'll be taking a look where we right, where we wrong and to sort of predict a bit of a trend as well, like in terms of financings and putting financings in a bit of a macro context. Should you buy? Should you sell? Should you hold right now? Because one thing as well, there's uh, usually financings come up with a four month hold. So providing some perspective around the time when maybe those shares come pre trading and what kind of environment we'll be finding ourselves in will probably be part of that conversation. Great. Well, looking forward to that. And uh, I'll see you at the VRIC. And thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, thanks, Jesse. Thanks so much. And uh, can't wait to see you in Vancouver. We actually need to have a damn good recession. The Russian economy is a gas station run by the mafia. $41 trillion has been created out of nothing. There's a stranglehold in China on most of these resources. The outlook and fundamentals for the metals remains very, very strong.